And here we have our three main factors why people are committing fraud these days. I don't know. Probably always been this way. All right. The fraud triangle, it's this concept here. We'll see this slide in a second. But this fraud triangle, these are the reasons, and, and I think they're pretty extensive, right? Why would someone commit fraud in an organization? First is incentive. Have you ever felt incentivized to commit fraud? I'll leave that for you to internalize yourself. I'm not going to ask you that. An employee feels pressure from financial woes, addictions, societal pressures, anything like that, right? You've got a gambling addiction. Be incentivized to steal some money from the company. Uh, if times are tough, you got to pay a credit card bill, might be incentivized to steal from the company. It's just, that's incentive. There's something pushing you to want to steal. Next is opportunity. I mean, you're just in the warehouse, right? And you realize that no one's counting the TVs and you just see an opportunity and you just steal the TVs. An employee sees a gap within the company's internal controls. Just, hey, I can, so I will. Lastly, we have rationalization. This one, right? An employee feels that he or she deserves more money for themselves. Oh, I've worked so hard. They create a narrative in their mind that committing fraud is not a bad thing. Now, you know, here we get into a little bit of a gray area, right? Oh, I should charge more to the client because I deserve it. And you shouldn't do that. You should be ethical in all of this, right? We should not rationalize in our mind that we deserve to commit fraud in any instance. Oh, I should um, take some of these checks and cash them for myself because I didn't get a bonus this year. There are healthy ways to deal with this and committing fraud is not one of them. Here's our actual fraud triangle depicted in a nice graphic. And just because all three of these may be present does not mean that fraud has definitely occurred. That, that could be a question you see. Oh, rationalization and opportunity could be there, but you can't just assume that fraud is there. Now, of course, you're going to be professionally skeptic and you're going to test and see if there's fraud, right? If you see weak internal controls and you see the ability for someone to steal cash from the company, you're not going to immediately definitively assume that fraud has happened. However, you're going to investigate this and just see if it has happened. Similarly, just because none of these may be present, so maybe they have solid internal controls, everyone gets paid well, so they don't feel the need to steal anything and you know, no one's got incentives or rationalizations, just because none of these are present does not mean that fraud has not occurred. So just keep that in mind. If all three are present or two or one, or maybe none of them are present at all, that's not an indication if fraud has happened or not happened. So you can't just say, okay, you know, it's, fraud's probably happened because one of these factors is there or not happened because none of them are there. So usually when, also usually when fraud occurs, there are conditions present such as ineffective controls and justification of fraudulent behavior. Now those are some points taken from multiple choice questions, some topics you may see without, throughout the exam. Let's just talk about these a little bit further, right? Financial pressure, incentive, greed, addictions, poor credit rating or cash management. If you can't budget yourself, you're just like, oh, I'll just steal money from the company. Uh, work pressure, dissatisfaction with pay, you were overlooked for promotion. So you're just incentivized. You have this reason that you would want to do this. Opportunity, you're just going to steal because you can, right? Um, the company has a lot of inventory just sitting around and you're going to steal them because no one's watching it. Ineffective monitoring of those internal controls, weak effective internal controls. Rationalization. I'll pay it back. I'm just borrowing the money. You know, it's like I'll take $100 out of the cash register. I'll put that $100 back in. Even if you do put it back in, that's still fraud. Just taking money out of the cash register. Even if you give it back and it's like it never happened, that still is fraud. Well, I deserve a pay raise. It's for a good purpose. I'm going to steal it and donate it to charity. <laughs> that's still fraud. Sorry to break it to you, but that is fraud. You know me, I love practical examples. So let's run through a bunch of examples. And by the end of this, I want you to be so certain to be able to tell which of the three is it incentive slash pressures, opportunity or rationalization in each situation. And these could be sims, right? So you could be given examples. First, you have to determine what's the, is it, is it incentive? Is it opportunity or is it rationalization? And then also you have to determine, is it a misappropriation of assets or is it fraudulent reporting? Now, what's the difference here? Misappropriation of assets, both of these are fraud. And a misappropriation of assets would be stealing cash, stealing assets, like just, just misappropriating those assets, taking those assets for yourself. Fraud, fraud from fraudulent reporting would be fudging the numbers. Now, you know, both are obviously different, right? Like this could be, you would think of misappropriation of assets more as a, as a personal gain, whereas 
right here, fraudulent reporting is probably maybe management saying we need our financial statements to look good. So let's fudge the numbers. However, you know, management could misappropriate assets for themselves and smaller level individuals in the company could commit fraudulent reporting to make, to make their segments look better. So it does have an inclination toward one or the other, but there are, there are going to be so many examples we see here. Just have an open mind and be able to identify because this could easily be a sin. First, let's look incentives and pressures that result in misstatements from misappropriation of assets. So an employee steals money from the company due to increasing credit card bills at home. Makes sense. I mean, it doesn't make sense. You should commit fraud. Do not commit fraud. I'm telling you that right now. But that makes sense that that would be an incentive or a pressure. You know, newborn child, you don't have the funds to support the child. You can start stealing money from the company. You also have a warehouse manager, has access to various different products in the company's warehouse. She sees all of her neighbors with very nice possessions. So she steals significant amounts of inventory to sell. Maybe she's got a side business of stealing, of, of selling stolen goods uh, in order to keep up with the neighbors. Lastly, we've got an example here. The company's warehouse manager has been writing off inventory, declaring it damaged, when in reality, he gives it to his friend at a pawn shop to sell for cash. So you can notice that all of these examples could easily result in fraudulent reporting as well. You know, if you're writing things off, that could result in fraudulent reporting. I mean, this example, however, just it just bleeds the example of uh, misappropriating assets. But for example, this, this one right here, if you're stealing money from the company, you could still be properly stating the financials. Well, in reality, the financials wouldn't be uh, stated properly because, well, the cash isn't there anymore, so you don't have the cash. But you could keep up the appearance that the cash is there. So you see how there's overlap here. Just want to kind of give that, give that idea as you're seeing this. Now let's address the misstatements from fraudulent reporting. We'll say new regulations have been instituted, which are straining the company. Management is concerned about financial stability and profitability, and they have misstated financial results. They just say they earn more revenue than they really did. They say that they have more assets than they really do. That would just be what example would be there. Also, another example would be management has significant bonus payouts tied to financial performance of the company. As such, key individuals have signed off on false data, which would earn them these bonuses. So we need a PE ratio of 30, right? So we need a, a price to earnings of 30. And let's say we fudge the numbers to make sure if we reach that PE ratio, we get a 2% bonus. So management says, yo, I would like a bonus. Let's fudge the numbers. So we get the bonus. That's what we would see there. Lastly here, the company has a vast amount of inventory, which management deems as obsolete as compared to competitors' products. There's always innovation going. Let's say you've got a bunch of iPhone 4s on hand. Obviously, those are not, whenever you're listening to this, I'm sure it'll be quite a way from when the iPhone 4 was out. I think, what are we at now? Probably the 14, I don't know, 15, 16, 17. Yeah, that would be a problem because despite this, management has decided not to write down the value of the inventory. If you've got inventory that's obsolete and not worth as much as you're reporting it as, that's a problem. We need to write it down because inventory is an asset. There's an inclination to overstate assets. However, it needs to be properly stated. I'm having fun with these examples. I hope you are as well. Make sure you're always looking out for these when you're an auditor, when you are doing this for a company. Right? These are all, I'd say these are all very much real examples that could very easily happen. Rolling along with our wonderful fun examples of real life instances of possible fraud. Let's dive into opportunities for fraud. This is where an employee or individual has the opportunity to commit fraud. That's why they do it. They just do it because they can. We'll start again with misappropriation of assets. This is where the company maintains large quantities of physical cash on hand, which is at a risk as employees can much more easily steal it. Some solutions here would be a lockbox system, keeping your money at the bank, you know, just uh, a lot of something like that. But generally, yeah, there's a lot of physical cash on hand that is going to be an opportunity for theft. Another example, assets such as cash, inventory, and PP&E do not have proper safeguards to prevent theft. As such, employees have stolen these assets. Not good, not good at all. Last example here, a purchasing manager for the company is solely responsible for acquiring inventory. This individual, she is the only person who acquires inventory. She goes to her friend's company who sells the inventory and makes an agreement to purchase the inventory for a significant premium in exchange for a kickback. Now, that is an issue because you're spending your own company's money, like you don't own the company, right? You work for the company. You're spending the money of the company you work for, and you're spending more of it than you should be, and taking it, you know, kickback, a bribe. So 
normally the inventory you should be able to purchase for $10. You buy it from your friend for $15. And for every piece of inventory purchased, that $5 difference, or maybe you split it with you and the friend, you know, she splits it with her and the friend. Maybe she gets $3 and the friend gets $2. You're just doing normal business transaction, but you're overpaying so that that money gets distributed among the two, the two cheaters, the two fraudsters. What about from fraudulent reporting, misstatements from that? The company has significant quantities of cash, which it keeps in offshore bank accounts. It uses these accounts to hide its assets. That would be fraudulent reporting right there. If you're not directly reporting absolutely everything you have. Now, this might make you look bad, right? Because you don't have as much cash. Like, why would you underreport cash? I mean, obviously, if it's illegal money, if there's instances like that, that would be a situation to take into account. But yeah, this would be whether it's overstating or understating, that's still fraudulent reporting. That's still incorrect reporting. The company's board of directors and audit committee have ineffective oversight over internal control. As such, members of the organization have bypassed internal controls and reported false numbers. This could be in any account, any transaction class. Let's see, the company has had significant related party transactions that were not in the ordinary course of business. Now, related party transactions are fine. Yes, you should investigate them a little bit more, but as long as they're disclosed and they're legitimate and if they're fair, then that's totally fine. However, these are not in the ordinary course of business, and these transactions are unique and complex, which has allowed the company to fraudulently report the transactions. That is a problem. We want to avoid that. All right, let's knock it out here with our attitude slash rationalization. Oh, I should get more money. Now, what are some examples of misstatements from misappropriation of assets here? A key employee of the organization feels that his salary is not competitive enough. Hey, join the club, fam. <laughs> He's in a position within management that allows him to create a fictitious new hire position, issue paychecks, and collect them for himself. Now, this is why it's important to separate out your, and we'll talk about this in internal controls and the payroll cycle and all of the business cycles. It's critically important that those who hire employees are separate from those who pay the employees, are separate from you know, we, we have all these things separated out because here, if you're able to falsely say that you hired someone, issue them paychecks, and then you collect the paychecks, I mean, th that's just completely blatant disregard for internal controls. This is, and I'm not going to say it's a common scheme. I'm not actually sure how commonly this happens in the real world, but this is something you'll see throughout the exam. This is a solid example of a way that a breach of internal controls could allow for fraud. Next, an employee has access to the company's cash and feels that he has been working hard enough to just simply borrow the funds. So you're just borrowing. You're not really stealing. You're just going to use it now to pay down some expensive debt and then pay it back. He plans on returning the money. He has been working long hours, so he feels he deserves to be able to do this. Well, sorry, unless it explicitly says in your employment contract, yeah, you could borrow money from us. That's not going to be allowed. Next up, we have our fraudulent reporting again. Management has been increasingly eager to increase the company's stock price. As such, they have taken more aggressive positions when it comes to estimates. Yeah, we estimate that we'll collect you know, a lot more revenue next year than we think, and we, we uh, aggressively bump that up, but that's due to an attitude or rationalization. Management has not been correcting significant deficiencies in internal control in a timely manner. As such, the lack of internal controls has led to incorrect numbers being stated. So this is attitude. They've been possibly lazy here, right? An attitude doesn't just have to be, oh, I deserve this. It could also just be, I'm being lazy. Like, I don't really care. I don't really care about protecting the company. That's not how members of an organization should function. Hey there. Are you ready to not only pass your CPA exams, but truly understand and enjoy the material while studying? I know it seems impossible, right? Especially to enjoy the material. We'll do it together. Tap into the power of cpa.examprep.ai where we've got personalized quizzes, multiple choice questions, memorization guides, flashcards, simulations, all tailored to your learning. Our adaptive study planning puts you on the fastest path to success and lifts you back up if you fall behind. Avoid wasting your precious time and money attempting an exam with a low chance of passing because who wants that? We want to get you through this process as quick as possible. Our exam readiness prediction lets you walk in with confidence knowing that you're prepared for success on exam day. Thankfully, there's no payment method needed to get started. So why don't you come join us? Visit cpa.examprep.ai and let's achieve your exam success together.